Welcome to Do Theology, where we keep doctrine in its place. It can be argued that the redemptive historical hermeneutic has become the most popular method for interpreting the Bible today, especially in conservative Christian circles through the writings of reformed hermeneutics guys like Goldsworthy, Chapel, Gradenus, Johnson, and others. Its popularity is certainly understandable. Many sermons using this methodology are soul-stirring, and the emphasis on seeing Christ sounds like the more pious approach. But even though there are things we appreciate about the redemptive historical hermeneutic or the Christocentric hermeneutic, we believe that this hermeneutic is unnecessarily narrow in its approach. It's flawed in its practice, and it cannot be self-authenticated as a methodology. More on that after the music. Neither Bethel nor Hillsong meet the biblical definition of a true church. Did you know that Jesus was born again? Is his view heretical? If it isn't, then there's no such thing as heresy. It's not just a black and white issue. There's an issue, there's a question of moderation and how damaging and how harmful things are. Not every act of divine revelation is equal in authority. Angelic forces, angelic reinforcement, gahata, anda, ata, I mean, it's, it's hard to even respond to that, isn't it? It's, it's mind-numbing, it's blasphemous. When the apostles use the word atonement, they do not depict an angry God. It's cryptic, it's watered down, it has nothing to do with the judicial aspect of the Christian gospel. The most important of all doctrines is that the Bible is the word of God. They have different ideas than you do. You don't have to automatically kick them out of the kingdom. All right. Welcome back to Do Theology. And Ken, I have to apologize to you. Okay. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we started recording, I, I ate my lunch in front of you, which felt a little gross. It's a meatloaf sandwich oh. on my wife's homemade sourdough, which she started making before it was cool. I should mention she didn't start making sourdough when everybody started making sourdough. But, uh, yeah, I had my meatloaf sandwich with cheddar cheese and no dill pickle today. A regrettable I, I omission. I forgot to bring it. And then I thought, what's the big deal? That's a terrible joke. <laughs> and then, uh, put some Heinz ketchup on that bad boy. It has to be Heinz. I think that's their slogan. It, is, uh, there's never been a more accurate slogan. It has to be Heinz. I'm a super big Heinz ketchup fan. And I, do you remember in 2004 when George Bush and, was running against John Kerry for the presidency and like John Kerry's wife was from the Heinz family. And so Republican people, like a lot of Republican people started buying more Hunt's ketchup <laughs> to not support uh, John Kerry, uh, his family. You don't remember I any of that? I had no idea that was a thing. Every time I have Hunt's ketchup, it's like, oh man, this is inferior. Oh, no. I'm supporting John Kerry. <laughs> well, with Heinz, I'm supporting John Kerry, but I don't care because it tastes so good. And lightly salted Lay's. Hey, that is the best right there. That is, you cannot get better, anything better than lightly salted Lay's potato chips. They're really, really good. Yeah. What was your lunch? Probably just soup or something boring, huh? Uh, I had a grilled cheese sandwich. I knew it. Also, though, cooked on sourdough bread that my wife made with the recipe that she got from your wife. All so, right. Yeah. Many thanks. Yeah, my, uh, Melissa made a softer sourdough for me because uh, the traditional sourdough that's like a, a circle and long pieces with lot, lots of airy holes and stuff in it, it's just too hard. It like hurts my mouth when I eat it. So it's like a softer, uh, you, for, for a softer guy. Yeah. <laughs> Poor delicates, man. <laughs> so this isn't about hermeneutics yet. We should make this <laughs> about hermeneutics. <laughs> okay. All right. Now I feel like I need to apologize on your behalf for all the listeners who just had to endure that oh, when they're wow. anticipating a riveting conversation about redemptive historical hermeneutics. This was riveting just in a different way. Yeah. Why don't you start? Why don't you get this train moving in the right, <laughs> the right direction here? 
<laughs> All right, so as you heard from the intro there, we are going to be talking about the redemptive historical hermeneutic. And yeah, we have some disagreements. We have some issues with that approach. Uh, but before we get into what those things are in particular, we did want to just kind of present a bit of a, a positive presentation of, well, what is it that the redemptive historical approach teaches, where are they coming from? And our goal is actually to present this as if we held to the system ourselves, so that if someone listening uh, were to be of this, to view things through this persuasion lens, of this persuasion, yeah, um, that they could say, yes, that's exactly what I believe. That's exactly how I think we should approach the scriptures. And so that's our goal with that. Uh, we don't want to be building up a straw man for us to tear down. We want to we want to steel man the arguments and then still show that the grammatical, historical, contextual hermeneutic is superior. So uh, that is that's what's on the agenda for today. Uh, the redemptive historical hermeneutic. Sometimes it's called the Christocentric hermeneutic. Uh, those terms we find are used pretty interchangeably um but yeah that's that's uh that is what we're doing we're gonna give us a baseline definition sure yeah and again we do want to stress that point that we are going to say redemptive historical and christocentric interchangeably so some some people listening might say well you're getting off onto the wrong foot because that's not what i believe i believe they're different and here's why well send us a message because we couldn't really figure out uh, major ways that they're different, perhaps a few minor ways. But uh, this is what we'll say about that approach to hermeneutics, the general reformed theology, covenant theology approach to hermeneutics is this. The person and work of Jesus Christ is the interpretive key to all biblical text because Jesus is the final and fullest expression of God's kingdom. The person and work of Jesus Christ is the interpretive key to all biblical texts because Jesus is the final and fullest expression of God's kingdom. So let's explain more what that means. Yeah, so the that concept, again, as we've approached studying this, we have sought to read original sources. Um, I've got, even just right in front of me right now, Dennis Johnson's Hymn We Proclaim preaching Christ from all the scriptures. And, and he's, he's somebody that a lot of people point to as being uh, heavily influential and critical to understand our understanding of what, uh, how we should approach preaching and teaching from God's word. I also have Graham Goldsworthy, Mr. Uh, Mr. Golden Graham, <laughs> gospel centered hermeneutics, foundations and principles of evangelical biblical interpretation and he's actually going to say almost word for word what we have offered as kind of a baseline definition of what the redemptive historical hermeneutic is is that the person work of christ is the interpretive key to all biblical texts because jesus is the final and fullest expression of god's kingdom that's not a direct word for word quote from Goldsworthy, but it's it's really close. Uh, so yeah. that's th- those ideas are present in these works. And I know you've got some different books you've been referencing as well. Yeah, I've got Goldsworthy, Graham Goldsworthy, preaching the whole Bible as Christian scripture. You can see my notes that I got in there. Read through that. Um, Gray Danis, preaching Christ from the Old Testament. And uh, a really popular book, Christ-Centered Preaching by yeah. Brian Chapel. And what we find when we read through these is they're all like quoting each other. All, mm-hmm. So this is the Reformed hermeneutics community, it certainly seems like. And uh, we just want to articulate what they articulate. And what we've found as we've studied through these uh, different articulations of the Reformed hermeneutic is that there are a few New Testament passages that really serve as the starting point to understanding where they're coming from. And one of those is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul wrote to this church in Corinth saying, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Goldsworthy, for example, is going to point to this text and say, Look, we can't read through the Bible just chronologically. We live on this side of the closed canon. We have the whole canon. Let's go, let's start in the Bible with salvation because that's where our Christian life started. So we're going to start with Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all Paul desired to know. Let's desire to know that the person and work of Jesus Christ, not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament and view the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. So don't start 
chrono and, and limit yourself to this chronological progressive revelation, but instead let's build a framework, uh, a lens for viewing scripture that starts with the person and work of Jesus Christ and sees him as the final and fullest expression of God's kingdom in both testaments. Yeah, so that, that is really a, a foundational text, especially for the homiletical side of things of preaching Christ, uh, that, where that really comes into play for, uh, for this viewpoint. There's also another really common uh, text is the Road to Emmaus text from Luke chapter 24, where Jesus is, he appears on the road to Emmaus. There's a couple of disciples, they're walking along and they're talking about things and Jesus kind of joins the conversation. So oh, what are you talking about? And they explain, oh yeah, have you not heard about the things going on in Jerusalem? Like, what things? And they said all these things and Jesus replies um, to them as they are still wrestling with how they ought to understand the events that have been unfolding in the last few days. Jesus says in, this is Luke 24, beginning in verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then this is the key verse. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so from the redemptive historical perspective that looks at that passage and says, oh, wow. So all the Old Testament, that's actually about Jesus. Everything that was written before, that's about Jesus Christ. And Jesus, you know, it's like, oh, man, what I would have loved to be a part of that conversation to be hearing about how Jesus himself was revealing information about himself throughout the rest of the Old Testament. And so there's that, um, that strong connection with, with that text, uh, with how Jesus was explaining these Old Testament texts and saying, hey, this is actually about Jesus. Therefore, all the Old Testament is truly about Jesus. Yeah, Gray Danis in, in his book that I have, he <clears throat> says that Jesus again and again in the Gospels speaks of his role as one of fulfilling scripture. He says that the gospel event is to be seen as the completion and fulfillment of all God saving acts and promises in the old Testament. And he gives a footnote there with a bunch of, uh, new Testament verses, gospel uh, verses from the gospels where Jesus says like in Matthew three fifteen, uh, when he's getting baptized permitted at this time, for in this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Matthew five seventeen. do not think I came to abolish the law and the, or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Uh, Matthew 26, 56, all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. He uses fulfillment language all throughout the gospels, quoting uh, Goldsworthy references, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so he's saying, look, all this fulfillment language is showing us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. The person and work of Christ fulfills all of God's promises made in the Old Testament. It's all about him and his work. Yes. Central to all of this is also the theme of redemption. If everything is about Jesus, if it's all been pointing to him this entire time, and what Jesus did on the cross is the work of redemption, sitting down and, and completing everything on the cross, it is finished. And uh, that is the and that is the overall theme, right? Everything's been pointing up to that. It begins all the way even back in the book of Genesis with the giving of the first gospel. And so when uh, God gives the promise to Adam and Eve in the garden about the seed that will crush the serpent's head, that begins that theme of redemption that's going to be carried through. We'll see it throughout the rest of the Old Testament, even the book of Genesis. There's lots of uh, allusions to redemption and the concepts there. And then throughout the rest of the Old Testament, leading up to the point of Jesus Christ. And this reveals God's great plan of redemption for all mankind around the world in all ages through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I think you've got another another quote regarding the concept of redemption. Yeah, uh, this is from Brian Chappell's book, the Christ-Centered Preaching book, where <laughs> Brian Chappell is quoting Sidney Gradanis, who is quoting Van Veer. No, Vant Veer. That's an interesting name. I don't know. I didn't read any of his original stuff. But um, Brian Chappell says, Sidney Gradanis states the implications that this organic view of Scripture holds 
for proper exposition of a text. And now he's going to quote Gray Danis starting here. The unity of redemptive history implies the Christocentric nature of every historical text. Redemptive history is the history of Christ. He stands at its center, but center, not center. <laughs> uh, my Midwest accent kicked in there. <laughs> he, he stands at its center, but no less at its beginning and end. Scripture discloses this theme, the scopus, its historiography, right at the beginning. Genesis 3.15, Vantveer says, places all subsequent events in the light of the tremendous battle between Christ coming into the world and Satan, the ruler of this world, and places all events in the light of the complete victory which the seed of the woman shall attain. So very clearly the, the theme of Jesus Christ and his redemptive work uh, that's the overarching theme of the whole Bible. That is the key to understanding all biblical texts. Yeah. So, and if I if I have this straight, so that was that was Jeremy Howard quoting Brian Chapel, qu quoting Gray Donis, quoting some guy named Van Veer. Yeah, Van Veer. That Van -Veer. V -A -N apostrophe T. Oh my! That's unprecedented. Yeah. That is quite the quite the chain. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, get us off track a little bit there. But so that, that's the idea, though. That yeah, the redemption is the central theme. Uh, everything is re read through that lens. There's redemptive history. The history of, of the world is is redemptive history, and thus Christ is the interpretive key. Therefore, to understand any text, New Testament or Old Testament, we've got to be viewing it through this lens. Since Jesus Christ is the perfect fulfillment of all things, when we read texts in the Old Testament, we ought to be reading them and viewing them in light of the person and work of Jesus Christ and trying to find and fit where Jesus fits into these Old Testament texts. Yeah, that's it. Um, all things have to find their fulfillment in the person and work of Christ. And all the promises then, if from this view, all the promises of the Old Covenant that were given before the coming of Christ are fulfilled among the new covenant people who have come to Christ. They are the true Israel. This is where um, the hermeneutic really starts to part ways with yeah. us, but we, we're not getting to that point yet. <laughs> we're just <laughs> wanting to, to define theirs. So all texts, this is the order, all texts relate to the person and work of Christ, and that's the only way they can be fully understood. Mm -hmm. Sidney Gray Danis makes that really clear in, in his works. Yeah. Even more... All things must find their fulfillment in the person and work of Christ. Even, even more, more, all the promises of the old covenant that were given before the coming of Christ are fulfilled among the new covenant people who have come to Christ, the true Israel. Yes. So it all, all leads to that one central point. Yep. Yep. Now, sometimes, you know, when uh, when people are might be trying to offer a little bit of pushback to, towards the system and asking questions about, oh, okay, is this really legitimate to be reading the Old Testament in this way, where um, you know, like the, the Old Testament really doesn't know anything about the New Testament church, right? Paul will even say that the New Testament church is a mystery in the New Testament. Uh, and so there's there's lots of details and there's lots of things that are not really clear in the Old Testament. So is it really legitimate for us to speak of there being this New Testament fulfillment of these Old Testament things when that doesn't seem to be present there in the Old Testament? And a redemptive historical guy is going to say, well, really, we're just trying to read the Bible the way Jesus and the apostles read the Bible. And so they're going to look at various texts uh, that different things that Jesus said, like the, the passages we already read, or different things that the apostles said, let's say in the book of Acts or in other places in the New Testament, and say, look, like they seem to be either reinterpreting or, or uh, having a, a fuller meaning, a fuller sense of what's going on in the Old Testament. And, and they're applying Old Testament truth in kind of a new way in the church. And so if that's what the apostles are doing, and if that's what Jesus is doing, and of course, Jesus is the the king of hermeneutics, right? Of course, it's it's his book, right? Everything's about Jesus Christ. So he absolutely has that liberty, and therefore he's serving as the example for us 
to be modeling after that, that we should also be seeking to interpret the Old Testament in the same way that Jesus and the apostles interpreted the Old Testament. And in, in that view, the Christocentric view, they're going to not regard the alignment between the capital A author and the lowercase a author as vital. It, it, you'll probably have difference of opinion among mm -hmm. reformed guys. Some will say, yeah, I mean, that's, it's somewhat important, you know, and they'll talk through that. And then you'll probably find guys who say it's not important at all. What really matters is what the capital A author was intending to communicate, whether or not the human author understood, yes. whether or not Ezekiel fully understood what he was writing. It doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is that Jesus has come. He has fulfilled all things. And now we are to understand Ezekiel that way instead of getting into Ezekiel's sandals and understanding what he was trying to say before the coming of Christ. We're not Jews. We are Christians. We need to re re read the Christian or read the Bible as Christian scripture. That's the main concern, whether or not there's an, a full alignment between capital A and lowercase a authors. And that's really a, a really important and good point. And the, we recognize that there is going to be a bit of a spectrum for how these principles are applied in the approach to actual Bible interpretation. Uh, just this last week, I was having a conversation with a gentleman who um, would say that the New Testament is actually showing us what the Old Testament authors, even the lowercase authors, meant the whole time. And so he's not saying, oh, we're, there's no reinterpretation going on. There's no changing of meaning. It's, he's, they're just revealing the actual meaning that they meant all along, but it was either unclear or it was veiled in the Old Testament. Now it is clarified in the New. Um, so again, and, and yeah. that's going to be different from how somebody else might approach it. So it's, but, but the general principles of what we've just laid out, we think is an accurate uh, summation of the redemptive historical approach to the scriptures. All right. A couple of things that we want to say before we get into our disagreements and, and talking about where we disagree. First is we want to say, reiterate really, because you heard this in previous episodes, that this is a valid hermeneutic. No, mm -hmm. we're obviously not saying it's the best. We're not even saying it's right, but we're saying it's valid. <laughs> Uh, so if you're a listener who embrace, embraces the redemptive historical or Christocentric hermeneutic, we want you to agree with what we're saying here as far as how we're articulating your view. If we've misarticulated the view, if we've said something that's wrong, just let us know. Reach out to us, mm -hmm. uh, show at dotheology.com. Send us an email. Find us on Facebook. Um, we know that you'll likely disagree with our critiques as we get into that, but we don't want you uh, to think that we've built a straw man here that we're critiquing. We want to critique the real deal. Uh, but all that said, we recognize that this hermeneutical system is a valid one in that it upholds the presuppositions that the Bible is given to us from God. It's a divine book and it's infallible. It's an errant um, and it has full authority. Okay. Yes. So we, we recognize that, um, you're, you're living in that realm. We're not saying, uh, these are enemies of the true church or anything like that. Uh, not don't get that impression. Yeah. No. Yeah. This isn't a matter of heresy. Uh, but we, we do believe it is a matter of stewardship of Bible interpretation. And so that's why we want to still critique it. But at the same time, we're recognizing it's a valid system. Yes. And also we, as we're about to anticipate, you know, going through some items and points that we do disagree with and think there are some shortfallings in this methodology, we first want to say that there's, there's some things that we think are good and helpful and appreciate about this approach and um, and how it, it has helped shape, I think, just the conversations and, and, and help us think through some of these things better. Uh, I really, really appreciate that the system seeks to exalt Christ. Christ is worthy to be exalted, right? Christ is worthy to be praised. He is our life, right? That is what scripture tells us. And so uh, that is a good thing to be exalting Christ. Um, as we're going to get into, it's just we want to exalt him everywhere that he is. And uh, we want to recognize the fullness of how God has revealed himself. Um, but we do appreciate and, and appre yeah, just appreciate the fact that they do exalt Christ. And they... Also, if you take this approach, um, you will most likely be avoiding a purely moral or behavioralistic approach to preaching and teaching. Yes. Yeah, that's something that comes up a lot. Uh, the, uh, the reason why many people end up in this camp of Reformed hermeneutics is because they were worn out by moralistic teaching where you, you teach from the Old Testament or 
um, especially the Old Testament, but it could be either. Yeah. And all you take away is, oh, I should just stop this certain behavior and try to live this certain behavior. And for this approach to hermeneutics to say, actually, there's there's theological stuff to unpack there, uh, not just this uh, live this way, don't live that way approach. That's really important. And we can appreciate that for sure. Absolutely. And, and we also want to say that we re- appreciate how this system seeks to find the harmony of Scripture, right? I, I really do think that this is part of the goal of seeking and trying to understand how Scripture has unfolded. Uh, the overall themes and the emphasis of this is seeking to say, okay, what what is the harmony that exists here between we've got the Old Testament, we've got the New Testament, we've got Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of the things in the Old Testament. I appreciate that it, that the redemptive historical approach, the Christocentric approach is seeking to bring about a harmony of the scriptures and viewing them as one unit, as one book that has been given to us and see the harmony through that. I think that it's, that is good. I think it's, it's a challenging task and I appreciate that this effort uh, to try to bring, to see that harmony and consistency through the scriptures. So let's get into our critiques. Yeah. Well, as implied by the name, the Christocentric hermeneutic seeks to elevate the person and work of the Son in reference to the church as we read the Bible. And this in itself is not disagreeable. However, when his work in the church takes over or is set against or overcomes the greater purposes of God in the world— which are more than just the church, Bible interpretation errors begin to surface. Yes. What could be possibly wrong with highlighting the work, what Christ is doing in and through the church? What could possibly be wrong with that? Right. Yeah. I mean, it actually, they've done a great job taking the good name. Christocentric. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, so you want to take the hermeneutic that's not Christ centered? Right. Well, yeah, that makes us sound bad from the get go. And we're not against being Christ centered, right? It definitely sounds like the the more pious approach. I'm much more spiritual because I have the Christocentric approach. But well, which we, yeah. we're, we're we're not against being Christ centered. Correct. But what we are going to say is our argument, though, is that a full Christology, a a full and true Christocentricity is going to embrace everything about who Jesus is and what he has done. He is the Messiah, right? Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Well, he's the Jewish Messiah. So everything he is for the church, yes, absolutely. Praise God. We embrace that. But also everything he is and will be for Israel in accordance with all of the promises made to the nation of Israel throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. It's not like it's those promises only exist in the Old Testament. But we see the New Testament as not contradicting the Old. We see right. the New Testament as resting on the foundation of the Old Testament. And here in a moment, we're going to listen to a clip from Kim Riddlebarger where he's going to explain how the Christocentric hermeneutic sees that differently. But I, I think you and I could relate to the theologian, uh, and not talking about just scholars, but I don't lay people who believe this, who believe in the Christo centered approach. We can relate to them in the sense that if you start in the new Testament, all you had was the new Testament. You're going to have some passages in there that will sort of kind of lead you to believe or get you going down the road of, um, okay, there's just one group now and we shouldn't see Israel and the church as distinct. For example, Ephesians two talking about the one new man, right? Or Galatians chapter three talking about the true children of Abraham, you know, and and those are two big ones, but perhaps some others, you can look at those and think again, if you are just in the new Testament and think, okay, well, it seems like there is no distinction between the church and Israel at all. Um, and it, it, I'm not saying that those are, are clearly teaching that at all, but if that's all you had, you could start thinking that way. However, if you start with the foundation of the new Testament, which is the old Testament, and you recognize all that's been promised to Israel that will come to pass through the Messiah, not apart from the Messiah, but through the Messiah, through Jesus Christ, you realize mm-hmm. these things that are going to come to pass through him 
And then you read your New Testament and you see, okay, there are some similarities. There are some things that the Gentile, believing Gentiles share in, but it's not all things. You're going to have a fuller picture of, like you said, a, a full Christology of what Christ is doing in the church and in Israel in their future that will include a lot of similarities, but will also include some distinctions. And so that's really, I think, the, a big difference between uh, our approach and the more reformed approach is that we are going from the Old Testament into the New, considering things progressively as God revealed them. They're building on one another, never contradicting, never contradicting each other. And in the Old Testament, there are some things that aren't resolved by yeah. the institution of the church that will be resolved in the future messianic kingdom that was promised uh, to the Jews in the Old Testament. And what we also have to recognize and embrace is the reality that there are scores of prophecies and promises that have already been fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Yep. And they were fulfilled literally as stated in the Old Testament, that we see a one-to-one -one correlation between prophecy and its fulfillment in the New Testament. And so then we ask the question, why should we expect anything different moving forward with the rest of the promises that have yet to be fulfilled? I would argue that the basis for, for taking the rest of it as literally as the first part of it is because the first part of it's been fulfilled literally. Why should we expect anything different? Yeah, and going back to how we defined this hermeneutic, the redemptive historical or the, or the Christocentric hermeneutic, they're saying that all text must relate to the person and work of Christ in order to be fully understood. And then they make the connection, all things must find their fulfillment in the person and work of Christ. And then they make the connection, all the promises of the old covenant that were given before the coming of Christ are fulfilled among the new covenant people who have come to Christ here and now in the church, and they are the true Israel. And those are some theological connections where maybe on the first one or the first two, it's like, okay, yeah, I can agree. But then definitely as you get to those latter connections, it's like, I can't agree with that because we don't see the Bible teaching that. Uh, when we elevate one person of the Trinity and his work, over the other persons of the Trinity and their work, it will affect the way we read the Bible. And so when you elevate the work of Christ and building his church over and against perhaps the greater things that God's doing in the world, and I say greater not qualitatively, but quantitatively, that there are, there's a greater picture with more things happening, um, that's going to affect the way you understand the Old Testament. And in this Riddlebarger clip we're going to listen to, he sets it up as, look, I've got a uh, Riddlebarger saying of himself, I have a Christ-centered hermeneutic, and people like Ken and Jeremy, they've got a an Israel-centered hermeneutic. And we're looking at it and saying, is it that's not really the case. We don't put Israel at the center of our hermeneutic. We're looking at the promises of God, not limiting them to their fulfillment in the church alone. We're seeing what God is doing in the greater picture and what's actually happening is the ones with the Christ-centered hermeneutic are actually creating a church-centered hermeneutic where the church becomes central to the fulfillment of all the promises of God, and we just don't see that happening in the Bible. One thing before we get into this clip, I just I want to um, make sure that we're clarifying something and not misleading people. Uh, earlier, Jeremy made the comment about elevating one person of the Trinity and his work over the other persons of the Trinity and their work, we are not arguing that the different members of the Trinity have purposes and work that are at odds with one another. We, we believe there's harmony and that they, that they do have different roles within the functional order of the Trinity, not in the sense that there is a, a subordination or anything going on. This is the, sometimes in uh, theological terminology, it's called the economic Trinity. No, don't chase the rabbit of, yeah. uh, don't, let's not, let's not get into the EFS stuff. Huh? No, no, no. Uh, I wasn't going to go there at all. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, the, the reference of the economic Trinity, the different yeah. roles that the different individuals of the Trinity have, 
But we're not saying that those roles are at odds with one another. They work in harmony with one another. But we are saying that we think that at times the redemptive historical approach, the Christocentric approach, can look at one of those members of the Trinity and, and focus almost exclusively on that to the detriment of the full picture of what's going on with the roles, the harmonious roles that exist between the other members of the Trinity as well. And even limiting the scope of the work of Christ because uh, to me, and, and, and again, write into us and help, help me learn. If, if, this is, if I'm saying something that's wrong, you're listening to this and you have a Christocentric hermeneutic, write in and tell me, clarify this for me. But it really does seem to me that the work of Christ is being limited to the church. Mm-hmm. And we're saying there's more to the work of Christ than the church. Yeah. We're not saying right now there, there are two peoples of God. Or that if you're born a Jew, you're saved. Or that in the future, there's going to be two different, uh, you know, peoples of God in the eternal state existing side by side, Israel and the church. We're not saying those things. We're just saying the church hasn't always existed. Christ said, I will build my church. And when he was alive on the earth, he was talking about in the future, he was going to build his church. There were people that were saved before that. Okay, that's an important thing to recognize. There was more going on than the church leading up to the time of Christ's incarnation. And we look to the future and we see that the Bible's teaching that in the future there will be more going on than just the church. And so we want to be careful about limiting the scope of work to just Christ building a church. That's where all the fulfillment of everything is found is in the church. And then therefore we're going to elevate that one aspect of his work Mm -hmm. over everything else. It's going to overshadow everything else and nothing else can be considered other than Jesus's church being right. the fulfillment of all things. And so that's why we're saying this is more like a church centered hermeneutic right. rather than a Christo centric hermeneutic. So, yep. okay. Now play that clip. Mr. Kim Riddlebarger. Well, real, real quick, Ken, um, Kim Riddlebarger. Why are we playing this clip from him? Who's this guy? Why should, why should people care? Kim Riddlebarger is a, I don't know if he's a super well-known theologian, but he wrote a pretty uh, extensive book dealing with uh, amillennialism, making a case for amillennialism. Honestly, it's I think it's a pretty decent book. If you want a kind of layman's level approach, like a what is amillennialism, it's a good book. I've read it. It's I think it's helpful for understanding the posi- position. He taught at his church what is amillennialism and teaching through uh, that. In fact, this what we're about to play is, is from that series. So I, I, Riddlebarger is... I don't generally consider to be someone who kind of knows what he's talking about in these uh, in this field of of uh, whatever word is on the tip of my tongue that I it's not eschatology? coming out. Eschatology. There. <laughs> oh man. Well, yeah. Uh, I don't know how many lessons are in this All Millennialism 101 series. There's a playlist on YouTube, and this is interpreting Bible prophecy part one. That's the title of, of this session. And he definitely talks about his time as a dispensationalist being, um, transitioning into the all millennialist position. He talks about that a lot in the lessons I've listened to. I've, I've not listened to all of them, but, uh, we're going to play this clip where he's, uh, kind of summing up some hermeneutical principles from the all millennialist standpoint. And so he's going to start off by saying third, we're not playing first and second. We're jumping in and saying, okay, here he is in the middle of his list. And this is a really pertinent point that we're going to critique afterwards. So here's about three minutes of Kim Riddlebarger. That's why it is so important to allow that the old Testament writers predicted things in terms of their own period of time. And it's not until Christ comes and redemptive history continues to unfold that they can possibly understand what fulfillment would actually entail. And then third, it's a basic hermeneutical point that we're always to interpret such Old Testament figures in light of their New Testament significance. Um, If we don't do that, we end up reading the Bible through an Israel-centered hermeneutic, as our dispensational friends insist. We're standing in the Old Testament, looking ahead, and telling the New Testament what it has to say, as opposed to seeing Christ coming and looking back and telling us what those prophecies meant all along. I uh, can give you, a, I think, a real simple and helpful illustration. If we were to turn off the lights in this room and walk around, we'd bump into everything because we couldn't see it. If we turn the light on, all of a sudden the, room, the layout of the room would make sense to us because we could see what was here. That's exactly the relation of the Old Testament to the New. The Old Testament, everything's in place. It's just that without the light of Christ, we can't really make sense of it. 
When Christ comes, it's not as though everything changes. So now we've got the light to make sense of it. And that's all we're arguing. The light of Christ tells us what the Old Testament actually meant. And so Gaffin, I think, is helpful here when he reminds us, look, the New Testament should be allowed to explain the Old, quoting Gaffin. Is the New Testament to be allowed to interpret the Old as the best, most reliable interpretive tradition in the history of the church? And certainly the Reformed tradition has always insisted. Does the New Testament as a whole, as the God-breathed record of the eschatological endpoint of history and of special revelation provide the controlling vantage point for properly understanding the entire Old Testament, including its prophecies? Or alternatively, will the Old Testament become the hermeneutical fulcrum? We say New Testament, dispensations say Old Testament. And that is the point of contention, and that's what you have to decide. Now, you know, Gaffin's comment sounds self-evident, but that's not always the case. It's certainly not with dispensations. We argue that the New Testament provides the controlling interpretation of the Old Testament. And so when Ryrie says, look, if you don't interpret the Bible literally, you have no external controls, you can make any passage a wax nose and twist it to mean whatever you want, we've said all along, no, 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 no. The New Testament tells us what the Old Testament means. This isn't twisting the text. We're allowing Jesus and the apostles to tell us what those passages meant. And so the interpreter of the Old Testament is then uh, to look at how the New Testament writers treat these same themes. And if the New Testament writers spiritualize Old Testament prophecies by applying them what a dispensationalist would call a non-literal sense, then the Old Testament passage must be allowed to be read in light of the New Testament and not vice versa. And so the irony here is, since dispensationalists don't do that, they're not taking the Bible literally because they don't allow Jesus and the apostles to tell us what the Old Testament means. Is it not the literal interpretation of Scripture to let the apostles tell us what the Old Testament's about? All right. So um, I hope playing that was helpful for the listener to see how things are explained differently by someone in that camp than they would be by us. I counted no less than five times, I think it's closer to seven or eight times, where Riddlebarger is saying that the New Testament tells us what the Old Testament means. And what that means <laughs> is that without the New Testament, you cannot understand the meaning of the Old Testament. And that's incredibly problematic. Um, but, but what Riddlebarger is saying is like, you know, this is reading between the lines a little bit. This is my summary uh, of things. This isn't a direct quote from him. But once we get into the New Testament and the church is being built... We have the fulfillment of these things in the Old Testament that give us the true meaning of these things in the Old Testament. The person and work of Christ leading to the building of his church provide us with the meaning of what was written before. Therefore, without the person and work of Christ and without his building of his church, we are left looking at the Old Testament passages in a meaningless fashion. And there's so many problems with that that it's almost hard to even know where to begin on um, just on face level. Does it seem like the Old Testament audience was confused about the meaning of the Old Testament? No, they didn't nope. think so. <laughs> they thought it was perfectly plain and perfectly clear and understandable, and they knew what was what. Certainly. And, and let's go ahead. Well, let's use the specific example just so we're clear. So the listener's not wondering like, like what? I mean, the specific example would be a future back in their land with uh, surrounded by other nations yet existing in peace, uh, the cities being rebuilt, enjoying their Messiah, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Daniel, when he was in captivity, when the time of the captivity was going to come to an end, he saw the literal prophecy and how it was given in a, in the previous pre-exilic prophets as they were going into captivity, saw it was going to be 70 years from Jeremiah, and he read that, and he thought, oh, okay, we're coming to the end of 70 years, and so he spent time in prayer in anticipation for the people going back into the land. When the people came back into the land, they were being taught from the Word of God. This is Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, it says they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. 
the people understood what it was that the law of God was saying, and they understood what the scriptures taught. But how could that be since Jesus had not yet come to fulfill the law? That's the thing. That the, <laughs> the, uh, the redemptive historical approach, the Christocentric approach, has to say, well, they thought they understood it, but they didn't really, because yeah. it's really about Jesus. And we, we recognize First Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, they did not understand the person and time right. of which they were writing. They didn't understand those things. But we say that that's not meaning, that's significance or whatever other type of word you want to put to it. It's not like they didn't understand what they were writing. They didn't understand the things that God had not revealed to them. Right. God did not reveal uh, what the person would look like, when exactly, at what time the person would come. Uh, they just didn't know what they didn't know, but they did know what was revealed to them. And that's, you know, going, kind of going back to Deuteronomy 29, 29, uh, right. the things that have not been revealed, that, that's mysteries, that's for God, that's for Yahweh alone. But what has been revealed is for us and for our children. That's right. So it's, uh, yeah, to, to say that we can't make sense of the Old Testament without the light of the New Testament, I think, stretches beyond, I mean, it, it stretches several New Testament texts that they would appeal to. Like you mentioned that first Peter passage, uh, that's a passage that the, that the redemptive historical would appeal to, to say, Hey, look, they didn't understand what was going on in the New Testament. That's why we needed the New Testament, but that's not what the text actually says in first Peter. It, it, it says they didn't know specifically who the exact person of Jesus Christ was, but that doesn't mean that they didn't understand that they were looking for the Messiah and they didn't understand what the Messiah was going to do. Yeah. Riddlebarger uses that illustration of a dark room. So that's, that's what he's saying without the church and without the person and work of Christ that start, that began with his incarnation, what you have are a bunch of prophets who are just sitting around in a dark room and they don't know where anything is or what anything means. <laughs> it requires in his presentation, it requires the incarnation of the son of God and his building of his church to provide fulfillment of all things. That's the light that then lets us see what's going on in the room. And we just don't see that presentation in scripture. In fact, we see God speaking clearly in every age, in every dispensation. God speaks clearly to the creatures made in his image where they can understand what is being communicated. And to say that God spoke in a non-clear way is to put something on God that the Bible doesn't, God doesn't put that on himself. That's creating some sort of a category in Revelation where God is speaking uh, in such a way where the meaning is hidden. Now, now we recognize there are types and shadows that God provides those types mm -hmm. of things um, in his great plan. But to say that all those prophecies in the Old Testament weren't clear. Now we're talking about something that's categorically different than yes. types and shadows. Yes. Yeah. And, and to say also, um, one of the other comments that he made about, you know, the New Testament being the controlling interpretation, I think he, he, it just completely disregards the principle of progressive revelation that the, as as there's more revelation that is given, yes, we, we understand more of the picture, like we embrace that reality that, okay, yeah, there are some things that were revealed in an incomplete way in the Old Testament, and it's completed with some of the, with the information and the revelation given in the New Testament, but they're not at odds with one another. It's progressive revelation, not reinterpretation and correction or, uh, um, I don't know what the right word is, but it's, it's not changing any meaning of the Old Testament text. It builds upon itself and it's, it exists in harmony with each other. Yeah, like, like many other Reformed theologians, what I hear Riddlebarger doing is assuming a discontinuity between the Testaments. Yep. And so, you, so you're looking at the New Testament and Jesus coming, building his church and saying, okay, this theology is different than the Old Testament theology. Because in the Old Testament, they're expecting Israel to be restored. The Messiah is going to come, you know, kill the Romans, yeah. establish his kingdom, etc. Well, that's not what he did in his first advent. And so we see what is happening and say, well, this must be the truth because that's what's happening now. And what they thought was going to happen based on those prophecies 
well, that was, that was wrong. And the way those prophecies were worded, yeah, we understand how that can come across that way, but there's actually a hidden meaning there that talks about this New Testament reality that we're living in. So there's a, an assumed discontinuity between the Testaments in this New Testament theology is injected back on into the Old Testament or yeah. projected onto the Old Testament, which requires a changing of the meaning. And what we're saying is our New Testament theology has to be in harmony with the Old Testament theology that was revealed first. And that harmony can exist and does exist. We can't say that they're um, at face value. The New Testament and the Old Testament are at odds with one another mm -hmm. at face value. They're still in harmony. Yeah. And sometimes we, when we talk about these things, you know, someone might push back, oh, so you're saying we don't, we don't see Christ in the Old Testament at all. And we say, no, of course we see Christ in the Old Testament, but we want to see him where he actually is, and we don't want to read him into places where he is not. So we, we want to be careful and consistent with how we read Scripture. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And we don't want to read our New Testament apart from our Old Testament, because that does, I think, you know, going back to what I said before the clip, I think that does start to create a supposed discontinuity in people's minds. Yeah. Uh, if you begin with the Old Testament in forming your theology, now we're not saying, hey, yeah, go to... Go to Ezekiel if you want to be saved. That's not what we're saying. We recognize, yeah, you need to start with like the gospel of John if you want to understand salvation. If you're lost and uh, you're coming to know the Lord, that there are definitely, we're going to point you to the New Testament and have you read a book of the New Testament. Uh, but what we're saying is the process for developing your theology of what God is doing in the world is different from that of coming to know the Lord and the gospel. And as you read the Old Testament up through the New Testament, you're going to see a harmony as long as you allow the text to speak for itself and not seek after hidden meanings. Because what you end up doing is what Abner Chow calls creating a canon within a canon. Mm -hmm. And the New Testament is the authority over the Old Testament. Because you're saying, look, I look at this New Testament language. This is just different than, than what I see in the Old Testament. The New Testament is right because we're living in it. So it must have the authority over the old to tell us what the Old Testament actually meant with hidden meanings that are different than just plain interpretations. One of the, uh, he, he kind of anticipated a reply and, and a, a response that a dispensationalist might make about how, oh, well, then you can just make the text mean whatever you want it to mean if you can read how things however you want. And he replied, no, the, the New Testament tells us what the Old Testament meant. Therefore, we want to read it consistently with what the New Testament says about the Old Testament, which sounds all well and good in theory, but how that actually ends up getting applied and in practice does lead to all these places where there is no seatbelt. How you, how we, if, if you allow this to impact how you read every aspect of the Old Testament, it's going to take you to some places that are, to, to my mind, just absolutely quite strange. Uh, we could give different illustrations of what this looks like. Um, and perhaps we should spend uh, maybe an episode or half an episode in the future dealing with specific texts and how this principle gets applied in ways and then how we would understand those same texts. That might be helpful. But the meaning is often stretched to where there ends up being no seatbelt to where you can look at anything in the Old Testament and say, oh, that's that's clearly a type of Christ. When there is nothing mentioned about that in the New Testament whatsoever at all, and you're, you're making connections that exist purely in your imagination, and because it makes sense to you, well, then, hey, it must be correct. And I think the land is a big one. You know, I've, I've read in Anthony Hokema where he says, okay, look, where it, it talks about the nation of Israel going back into the land that God promised to the, the forefathers— it's actually talking about the people of God when it says the nation of Israel, generally the people of God. And when it talks about the land, it's not talking about the specific land. It's talking about generally the destiny of the people of God, which is a place of peace and safety because they're in the presence of God. The New Testament does not approach that type of allegorical interpretation mm -hmm. uh, or spiritualizing of those texts. That is something that man is doing on his own. Mm -hmm. to look for a hidden meaning to be more consistent with his theology or something. Song There's a motivation. Yeah, yeah. The song of Solomon is another, another place where people get a little, a little strange. <laughs> and so, yeah, where, where is the cutoff for that? 
I don't see a place where you can reasonably cut a person off. You just have to say, well, look, if this, then this, then this, then this, and it just kind of builds on itself. And that, I don't know, we, we know that obviously there are people who sit back in the reform community who sit back and say, look, these people have gone too far with their spiritualizing, their allegorizing, whatever. We, we can't go that far. But our question to you is why not? What's yeah. what's standard? By what standard? We're getting priests up. up there we here. go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so go ahead. We see. OK, it's this redemptive historical approach. It's it's overly narrow in its approach. Right. We we're calling a kind of a more church centered hermeneutic rather than broadly a Christocentric hermeneutic. We think it's flawed in its practice. It actually doesn't uh, how you actually apply those principles. It gets it leads us to some strange places, and it flows Incredibly out Incredibly subjective. Very subjective methodology. Um, finally, the last thing we want to talk about in this episode, there's more to come. There's a, there's a foreshadowing for you, but there's more to come. Uh, but just for this episode, we also think it is self-defeating in its starting place. It cannot be self-authenticated. I don't believe that you can use the redemptive historical hermeneutic to arrive at a redemptive historical hermeneutic. So, how do people arrive there, Ken? I think they have to misuse what they think is actually a grammatical historical hermeneutic in order to arrive at the redemptive historical hermeneutic. There's a, several key passages that we referenced when we were talking and defining about what the redemptive historical hermeneutic is and how they, they conclude what they conclude. Passages like the Road to Emmaus passage from Luke 24 about how Jesus, he was on the road and he explained to the uh, apostles there or the disciples there everything in the Old Testament that was written about himself. And so the conclusion is, oh, everything in the Old Testament is about himself. Yeah, the, the Christocentric guy will say, yeah, look, Jesus used a Christocentric hermeneutic. He right. was looking at the Old Testament and said, all of this is about me. So he's employing a Christocentric hermeneutic, right, Ken? But if we read that text, is that what the text actually says? Emphasizing the grammar part of the uh, grammatical, historical, contextual right. hermeneutic. What, what, what do we see if we're paying attention to grammar? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus revealed everything that was actually about himself. He talked about the things that all were actually about himself. But this to say that this text means that everything in the entire Old Testament is exactly about him is stretching the meaning of Luke 24 beyond what it is actually saying. Hmm. Yes, it's it's not exegeting that verse very carefully to say, oh, the things concerning himself means everything is concerning himself. Right. That's, that's just not what it says. What about the uh, the First Corinthians 2, 2 passage? We talked about that one. Yeah. Where Paul said, you know, I desired to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. The Christocentric guys are going to say, look, Paul taught with a Christocentric hermeneutic. He desired to know nothing among them except for the person and work of Christ and even the building up of his church. That's what Paul is saying there. Therefore, he probably, when he taught, uh, they wouldn't say probably, when he taught, he related all of those teachings to the person of Christ, his work on the cross, and his building of his church. So it's a Christocentric approach, right? Right, and it almost sounds like they're using a grammatical historical approach to arrive at that because they're reading that text and and trying to say that this is what it says at face value but again i think this is a misuse of the grammatical historical approach because paul is saying in that text i'm going to read at the first uh, first corinthians 2 1 and when i came to you brothers i did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of god with lofty speech or wisdom for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul is speaking about how he approached the Corinthians, about how he taught them, about how he evangelized them, and what manner of life he lived when he was amongst them. 
He was not he's saying that. He's talking about Go ahead. his character. Yeah. He's defending himself as he as he proclaims there, and so that the the faith might rest not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He's proclaiming Christ to, the, to them, but he is not saying that this is literally all that he ever ever talked about. And we referenced Abner Chow earlier, but he has another a lecture in which he talks about this pa- passage, and he makes it clear. He's like, yeah, you, what else does Paul act talk about in the book of First Corinthians? Is he just expounding upon the crucifixion of Christ throughout the entire book of 1 Corinthians? Nope. <laughs> You're right. He's not. Yeah, he, yeah if you take this um, literally, as it seems like the Christocentric guys are committed to doing, like uh, woodenly, literally, mm-hmm. then you arrive at the conclusion that Paul never talked to the Corinthians about the resurrection. Except he did. <laughs> Except he did. Right. 14 chapters later. Uh, yeah, right. there, he there, he there, talked yeah. to him uh, in this very letter about the resurrection. And he uh, talks to them in the letter by saying, <clears throat> or he says in this letter to them, that he makes known to them the gospel that he preached to them, which they also received. And he says, I delivered to you, past tense, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So Paul, and that in, he the was past, seen. <laughs> yeah. in, in the past, when he was with them before, he talked to them not just about Christ and him crucified, but also the resurrection, the yeah. burial. All sorts of stuff. Uh, yeah, there's no reason to take this verse woodenly and to apply it to Bible interpretation methods of how the New Testament uses the Old Testament. That is not what Paul is talking about in this section. He's talking about his character among them, which was to imitate Christ and to not only teach about Christ, but to live out the example that Christ has given us to be humble and not to be haughty or prideful in our knowledge and wisdom as the Corinthians were. That's the context. To say it's a Bible interpretation passage about how the New Testament uses the Old, that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah, stretching it really to the point of absurdity, I would say. So, because the reality is, is what ends up happening with the uh, with with what we argue for the grammatical, historical, contextual hermeneutic. A lot of times that gets applied to New Testament text by everybody, even by our Reformed yeah. brethren. They want they want yeah, to use. N- no one's going to say there's a hidden meaning in the resurrection of Christ. No one who's actually saved right. is going to say that, oh, the resurrection, that's actually a picture of something else, uh, like they do with the land promises to Israel, <laughs> right? right? They're going to look at that and say, Jesus literally rose from the dead. Yeah. And when Paul writes about mortifying the flesh in, in uh, Romans chapter 6, well, we actually understand that grammatically, historically, contextually in its context, what Paul is talking about, about how we should mortify the flesh there. And so there's this, the correct hermeneutic is getting applied in the New Testament to by everyone. But then when it comes to these other texts, they shift gears and, and, and start arguing for a different hermeneutic. And to me, that indicates that this is actually a self-defeating starting place. You can't self-authenticate your own hermeneutic. The Bible assumes that you're taking it and reading it at face value. The writers of the texts assume that the people they were writing to could read and could understand the grammar and the syntax of what was being communicated there. And, and what this means is that, or I guess the way I interpret this from people who use this Christocentric hermeneutic is they're going to use the grammatical, historical hermeneutic on texts that they believe are clear. They don't believe the Old Testament's clear. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that was the message of Riddlebarger in that clip. The yep. Old Testament's a dark room. It's not clear. So you have to use a different hermeneutical approach that brings out hidden meanings when you enter into the Old Testament. What we're saying is the Old Testament, just as clear as the New. Not It's not... Uh, On the timeline, it's not as advanced as the new. There's a lot of events that have taken place. The most important capital E event in all of human history, the the gospel work of Christ, his death on the cross and his resurrection, that certainly adds major significance to how all the promises in the Old Testament are, are going to be fulfilled. But that doesn't mean that they're somehow going to be fulfilled in a non-literal way, in a hidden meaning way, a spiritual way, or something like that. We believe that what God said he means, and what God has said, he's going to do. Amen.
Amen. Send us emails. Yeah. (laughs) If I could break it down percentage wise, or if you could break it down percentage wise, I'd be curious to know what percentage of where people are coming from who listen to our podcast. That would just be fascinating to hear. So if you just want to respond to us, just even, you don't even have to interact with any of our material if you don't want to, but just let us know, hey, this is where I'm coming from. I listen to your show and here's here's my approach to things. I'd just be curious to hear about that. And if this has challenged you in any way, let us know about that. And if there's something you disagree with, we particularly want to hear about that because we believe that having that conversation, about hearing, okay, we, maybe we weren't uh, as clear on one thing or maybe we are, are misrepresenting representing something in another way the communication with you the listener is only going to make our articulation of these these things better and it's only going to make our interaction with one another better so reach out to us show at do theology.com facebook.com slash do theology leave a comment on the youtube video send us a tweet however you want to reach out to us we would love to hear from you and until next time do theology that one was over an hour huh that's gonna be the hour